Uh, Sarah Robinson is an architect, writer, and educator. Her books, uh, Nesting Body Dwelling Mind uh, 2011, Mind in Architecture uh, with Yuhani Palasman 2015, and Architecture is a Verb 2021, which we use in, our, in my studio last semester, are among the first work to engage the dialogue between architecture and the cognitive sciences. Um, Sarah was the founding president of the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture Board of Governors. She's adjunct professor in architecture, design, and media technology at Albert University, Denmark, um, teaches, uh, and also teaches um, what she teaches, and is also a member of the scientific board at NAD, Neuroscience Applied to Architectural Design at IUAB Venice. Uh, Sarah, please. Uh, welcome. Okay. Might have to click this off. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> there we go. When that little when the little phone thing comes on, am I gonna click this whole? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Be right. All right. Thank you for hanging in there. We're almost there. There's wine being set up outside. So. <laughs> Hang in there, I repeat. <laughs> so I thought I'd take the opportunity since this is a conference on neurophenomenology to demonstrate what phenomenology may be able to do by talking about three firsthand experiences I've had in three different sacred spaces in three different parts of the world, in three different spiritual traditions, and then try to tie them together somehow, find their commonalities. So I was lucky enough to visit Iran and was hosted in Isfahan. So the first occasion I will recount took, took place at the Imam Mosque. Oh, this one. Yeah, just this screen. There we go, try it. Okay. One approaches the mosque from the public square, an open expanse with a pool of water in the center. And the mosque, rather than being the central feature, is tucked off to the side. Its enormous dome crowns behind a minaret framed Iwan. The mosque doesn't dominate, it beckons. I move up a flight of steps. The treads are deep and risers are shallow slowing my pace. To move in this way makes me feel like I should be wearing a gown. The imam that faces me is 45 times my height. Forcing my neck backwards to behold it in a strange mix of awe and welcome. I wonder whether the stalagmites were truly inspired by those that drip and accrete ever so slowly inside a cave. Memories of cavernous temples, Elora, Ajanta, Angkor Wat, seem to form a family resemblance. My earlier memories of being in those dark, damp, mysterious places return to my present. From here, I must pivot to the right at a slight angle, shifting my attention, shifting my gaze to an enclosed loggia. Where the ceilings are lower, but no less ornate, the light comes only from the sides, subdued as it moves through pointed arches and columns. I've come here as a tourist, not as a practitioner of Islam, but also as a faithful reader of the Sufi poets, Rumi, Hafiz, Sadi. This transition evokes a sense of grandeur, but in a tempered way, like being in a tamed and gentle landscape. Detail is everywhere, but does not force me to focus on any one thing. The pattern seems to recall the soft texture of leaves in an orchard, of rhythms befitting Rumi songs to the nectar of pomegranate and peach. Entering into this place is to be bathed in blue. I'm told there are seven colors in these tiles, but their presence is understated. They exist to harmonize, in this hymn of blue. 
And when the loggia opens to a courtyard, this blue expands to meet the azure sky. The shiny surface of the tiles softly reflects in this light. Blue spreads out like my attention. I feel a sense of freedom and release. And likewise, my footsteps. Beneath the curvature of the loggia, the stone floor responded ever so slightly to my gait. Now in this openness, there is no longer a soft echo. The sound of my steps are also released into this expanse of sky. From this vast rectangular opening, we enter beneath a large dome. The tile patterns diminish in size as they reach the apex. The center is empty and perhaps is the key to its latent power. Our host stands exactly below that point and whispers. The sound reaches above him and resounds on, its, on, it, on the curvatures. Our ears and bodies vibrate to the bass tones of his voice. It feels like a reenactment of an original utterance. I remember that the Quran was originally recited, performed long before it was written down, touching ears and emotions directly unmediated by text. This recital is now affected through even the softest voice and is reflected, rains down softly. The distance to the center seems to vanish. I'm immersed in voice, in breath. The second encounter is in France, just north of Lyon. It's Le Corbusier Saint-Marie de la Tourette a monastery built for Dominican brothers in the Catholic tradition. I was prepared to dislike the place. I'd come to spend a night and a day in one of the monk cells. The road meanders slowly up, crisscrossed with the shifting shadows of large sycamore and oaks. There are no signs of pretense or design. The grass is allowed to grow according to its will. And as we come closer, there are only small graphics, a forefinger almost touching the lips, requesting silence. And already my fixed opinion begins to soften. From afar, the structure appears to be a massive object, but once inside, that fixity too, gradually unfolds into movements, textures, gestures, patterns of light, shadow, surprises and delights. Constructed on a gentle downward slope, the entire complex is perched on pilotis, touching the earth lightly only at certain points. The church is the only place that enjoys full contact with the earth. So joining the brothers for the evening vespers entails a descent through halls and stairs whose windows open to the enclosed interior, rugged geometries, roofed in a felt of unruly grass. The church is connected to the living spaces on the inside by way of a ramp. Its walls are lined with glass that is thick and set into even thicker concrete. The deep mullions pattern floor and body with shadows that undulate. None of the divisions are even, they, like the polished concrete floors, are etched with the proportional system derived from the human body. This descent draws my attention to my center of gravity, just below the navel, priming my mind for what lies ahead. The ramp ends at a brass wall that's punctured with a hatch. It looks heavy, but is feather light on its hinges. Moving it feels like an act of grace, but also like violating a bank vault, as if I'd been let into a secret. I lift my foot over its metallic threshold. The transition between the light to the darkness is sudden and arresting. My vision weakens and my sense of hearing sharpens. I hear the space before I can see it and feel small inside of it. Light only enters from the sides and is gentle as it rakes softly behind the pews where the monks are seated, 
illuminating their hymnals. The monks are beholden to vows of poverty and silence, and then they open their mouths. Their voices leave their bodies to fill the darkness and then resound. Newly uttered words seem to blend with echoed ones in an aerial texture that fuses sound and light. We are facing each other. There is no center. The expanding volumes are located at the periphery. This weakening of focus allows me to sense with my whole body. My joints seem to loosen, allowing me to move to the rhythm of voice and breath. And the third space is located in Kyoto, Japan. Tucked away from the route to the more opulent temples, sheltered behind plastered walls that are themselves nested within a carefully tended garden, lies the temple of Shorin Inn. Boughs of a thousand year old camphor tree reach out from above. I turn to the left to scale the gentle slope. Again, shallow risers with generous runs, pebbles crunching underfoot. I enter through a gate crowned in glossy tiles, shadows of trees washing the walls. I still cannot see my destination, but I'm guided there along a stone and gravel path whose placement forces my attention downward. Fallen petals, moss, bird song, the sound of water. I remove my shoes before entering. I must pause and sit down in a gesture of preparation. I'm situated on the border of the liminal, quietly excited to cross a threshold. The wood inside is cedar. The boards are slightly uneven and finished only with the polish of countless footsteps. Resin, grass, and a soft breeze. My attention is directed outward and is carefully, carefully framed. I look out at the garden, but it is no longer a garden. I see it in its distillation. I'm no longer free to see what I wish. I'm not seeing the temple. I'm seeing the world according to the temple. And in this concentration, I sit, shorn of my belongings, yet protected, to notice my own breathing. Blowing in, exhaling out, cycling, garden, temple, myself, together in a shared breath. So now I wanna ask what these three spaces have in common. Beyond the obvious fact that they were each highly designed masterpieces that were created from a wealth of knowledge and practice. Each one is the fruit of a collaborative effort. Persian architects had mathematicians as advisors. La Tourette was designed not only by Le Corbusier, but by Yanis Xenakis, a mathematician, architect, engineer, and composer. And the Shorin Inn Temple was designed by masters who were versed in garden design and haiku. We could say that each of these sacred spaces physically embodies the cosmology of each religion and was carefully designed to elicit experiences that reinforced and made manifest these metaphysical systems. So in the spirit of Alfred North Whitehead, I would like to engage in some imaginative theorizing grounded in these firsthand experiences. While ostensibly each of these places is a container, I'd like to explore the possibility that they are also something more. Rather than the idea of an, an inert container or contained or the hylomorphic form content duality, I would suggest that they create synergies. That is, mind, body, spirit, and place interact in a way that is 
is greater than any one of those processes on their own, and that the relations between them are more powerful than any one process taken by itself. And in these instances, these processes are working together synchronously at the same time. Synergy and synchrony are ubiquitous phenomena in nature. And so I put some examples from different disciplines that study synchrony. And all of these disciplines have something to teach us architects. There's a really interesting body of work in psychology on interpersonal synchrony. And so this is Anthony Camaro's very, uh, he's a cognitive science who studies this and does experiments on interpersonal synchrony, how people act together under constraints as a, as a, as a unified, in a, in a unified synchronous way. The middle um, image is, is about our entrainment with the light, the cycles of light on a daily basis. And the third in a, the spirit of this symposium is Francisco Varela's experiment on um, what, he, what he calls perception shadow, which is when subjects were given moony faces, so when they're upside down, they don't look like anything, but when they're right side up, they look like a face. He found these synchronous patterns in, in the brain and called that the moment of perception. And this is an image of synergy and action. In this brilliant exhibit by Olafur Eliasson, play it again because it's so beautiful. A beam of light is cast on a vi vi viscous liquid and reflected on a metal plate that's large enough to walk through. And each of these, so in this instant, each of these components, the light beam, the viscous liquid, the metal plate is made greater in relationship. And in this interaction, generate something more powerful than each element could do by itself. And I also wanna to talk touch on the related phenomena of resonance. The most familiar example of resonance is what takes place inside of a musical instrument. The bow of a violin vibrates the strings which resound inside the body of the violin. Each material of its making impacts the resulting sound. Resonance demonstrates beautifully what happened to me in each of these sacred places. These experiences were synergistic processes that were intensified by the nature of the materials and their composition in each place. Resonance needs a body. Resonance amplifies sound by means of boundaries. The boundaries, like the body of a violin, reflect the vibrations back. And like the dome in the mosque that reinforces the sound waves at a point just below it. Resonance is a phenomenon of coupling. And how that coupling takes place depends on the frequency of the elements in the interaction. The grain of the wood in a violin is not only beautiful to look at, but performs a very specific function. The veining documents the life story of the tree, the stresses and tensions of its growth cycle. And these lines of force come to life when they're set in motion in the vibration of sound. Resonance also helps us to understand how something seemingly inert can influence perception. Again, an example from my own experience. Every morning at 5 a.m., a truck comes to deliver groceries two blocks away. And the sound that the truck, truck makes rattles the windows in our bedroom like clockwork every morning. Glass has, and so one day, my husband's an engineer, so I heard this rattling in the, in the, in the old lead glass and I was like, what is that? He's, he just turns over and says, it's resonance. <laughs> and to me, I was like, wow. Anyway, glass has a natural frequency to which it will vibrate easily. And the sound of the truck matches that frequent frequency, very matter of fact. 
The glass is set in motion by a distant sound. J.J. Gibson be began using the phenomenon of resonance to understand ecological perception. He suggested that our perceptual systems constituted by our sensory organs, the nervous system, our motor system, and their mutual interaction, couple with the invariant structure of environmental energy flows, similar to the way that a radio is attuned to a radio station by extracting the signal from the whole flowing array of frequencies. Perception for Gibson was not a matter of information processing, but of attunement with ecological flows of energy. And this, um, there's an interesting paper, I would refer you to this towards a theory of resonance by Vincent Raja that, that develops, that builds upon Gibson's thought, Gibson's ideas of resonance because in his in his during his lifetime it never moved beyond a metaphor but certain inactive cognitive sciences are are operationalizing resonance in their work um resonance is also a ubiquitous phenomenon in nature and is studied by diverse disciplines so these are different kind of resonance. There's a really interesting book that was written a few years ago by the sociologist Hartmut Rosa called Resonance. And he, um, he uses resonance to theorize our social situation in, in modern times. And some of these have direct impacts on architecture. And I propose that we can identify certain types of resonance that help us understand and investigate architectural experiences. And I'd like to go through each one of these in turn. The most familiar and perhaps most illustrative kind of resonance is acoustic resonance. In all of these sacred spaces, acoustic resonance was expertly used to generate precise effective states. An important characteristic of resonance is that it operates immersively, and although it activate, activates our sense of hearing in particular, it demonstrates how all of our senses work together in a synesthetic way. The Imam Mosque evokes the sound, sound and emotion together, and re reminds me, as I said earlier today, about John Dewey's insistence that the ear is the emotional sense. So this is a diagram of the Imam Mosque that I was that I had the good fortune to go in and it shows in a graphic way the sound of the vis visualization of sound literally raining down upon you. Islamic tradition has a very highly sophisticated sense of sound and acoustics. And um, if you're familiar with Murray Schaefer's work, his his soundscape book came out of his experience in Iran when he had a, he was there on the Fulbright scholarship. So this is the 13th century book of modes showing the principle that tone can be measured in space and is the basis for the longstanding correspondence between architecture and music. The soundscapes of Japanese gardens have been extensively studied and were intentionally designed to create certain feelings. The, the interest in atmospheres is, can be informed by, by the atmosphere in Japanese gardens. The, the, the character for atmosphere in Japanese is the two characters of breeze and feeling together. So we have this airborne feeling sense embodied in their landscape. And the, arc, the acoustic setting of absorbent materials with little reverberation is how con concert halls are designed today, appealing to our earliest sense of hearing that evolved in forest or open natural settings. This is a study that was funded by the National Institute of Health on listening to Japanese gardens and the techniques they use that can be um, reiterated in different, in different contexts.
I didn't talk about, I didn't have a slide on La Tourette. I want to go back a second. Um, so in the case of La Tourette, our sense of hearing is activated when our sense of vision weakens. The decentering process that occurs in a highly reverberant space emphasizes peripheral vision. Our sense of attention widens to encompass the whole. Now I want to talk about what I call proportional resonance. Proportional resonance occurs when the proportions of the space relate to these four dimensions, these different scales of proportioning, which I've called the breath, which is our basic regulator, the basic regulator of all of our body systems, the body, nature, and cosmos. So the Imam Mosque was, that I mentioned was designed in collaboration with mathematicians and a keen sense of human perception. It was designed in plan and section according to the golden section that was derived from natural and cosmic proportions. It has also been studied in terms of fractal ge geometries. This is a, a Koch curve that I overlaid on top of the, the E1 that I showed you guys, and it, it matches almost exactly. So um, fractal geometries are a geometry in which parts or, or components that make up a body resemble the entire body and the, is the ordering system found in nature. Here's another cot curve that I slipped in there, that white, that shows how similar the natural patterns of, a, of an orchard the blossoms in the orchard and the, and the texture, visual texture of a mosque. And then here is um, Le Corbusier's La Tourette, which was designed, the, the shadow patterns on the floor were designed by Yanis Sinakis, a musician, according to, to the modular, which was a harmonic system that had to do combine the dimensions of the human body with the golden proportion. And so the Dominican brothers took vows of silence and poverty. And so what happened in, in La Tourette is that Le Corbusier wanted to use sheet glass, but they didn't have enough money. So they made, they divided the glass with these concrete mullions, which made this incredibly, and, and no, no, no one of them is the same. And then they stamp the floor with the same kind of pattern. So when you're walking through the space, your, your vision and your body's pattern to, to this proportion based on the human body. And then um, Japanese temples are divided in terms of tatami mats. So they have a very precise ordering system as well. And and so also the grass that was used to create the tatami mats becomes a very visceral experience. So we resonate with proportions that relate to the dimensions of our body and the natural history of our perception. That is because we evolved in natural settings, we find the fractal patterns naturally pleasing. And again, in these in instances, form is a verb, form forms. Oh, this is, these slides are a little bit out of order, so I apologize. But this image, this overlay is a diagram of a Sufi poem, the structure of a Sufi poem, and that follows the, the rhythms of the human breath. And I just thought I'd overlay it on top to show the dimensioning system of the human breath. Okay. Sensory motor, motor res resonance refers to our sense of empathy. You experience sensory motor resonance when your lived body expands and temporarily includes aspects of your non-bodily environment, whether they're tools or other humans. Um, sensory motor empathy is skillful, implicit, and bodily engagement that grounds our experience. Um, and this, this, and empathy has a rich history in art history. Harry Mulgrave's scholarship has been instrumental in placing empathy at the forefront. These are more images of 
sensory motor resonance. These are dancers in the Lawrence Halpern Portland open space wearing Christmas tree lights. And when they move, they create this fluid pattern. And then there's chromatic resonance that takes place when light waves are amplified to create certain effective states. The contrast between dark and light demands a pause, a sort of experiential threshold that was used in La Tourette. In humans, rod cells are exclusively responsible for night vision and cone cells function only at higher illumination levels. So night vision is limited in resolution and the adaptation to darkness can take up to 20 to 30 minutes. You can understand how this weakening of visual acuity awakens your sense of hearing. Reduce light levels, shift the sensitivity of the eye towards the color blue. And this fact of our physiology seems to have been exploited at the Imam Mosque. This is a this is another example of the poverty. What made what makes look. La Tourette so great is that it was made with sim simple materials. So instead of stained glass windows, the sills are painted different colors. And these colors resonate through the space and they condition the space and filter your experience. And the light, the fact that the light only comes from the side very much directs your attention towards the periphery. There's no central place to focus on. So that lack of focus actually opens, opens the experience and, and it's, you're not concentrated, you're, you're sort of free to flow with the sound in the space. And the second image is, is another example of Oliver Ellion's exhibit, which is, which is literally chromatic resonance, which is a kaleidoscopic effect. When you have a small, you know, light going through any colored object, which churches and moss have exploited that same technique. So then there's metaphoric resonance, um, which takes place when imagery from one domain transfers across to another. It is also a ba basic feature of the way our minds work. Form here is evocative, triggering early latent memories fusing time and place. The Imam mosque with its stalagmite forms triggered memories of cave-like temples I'd, that I'd visited in Asia and seemed to form a family resemblance between them. This rich evocation sets the mind in motion as if a chord had been struck to release dormant memories. The dome of the blue in the mosque was both protective and inclusive, while also being freeing and expansive, like the dome of sky above us. So these different kinds of resonance and the fact that we naturally tend to synchronize suggest ways that we can activate everyday places with the same amount of care and concern that I hope I've been able to touch lately upon in these examples. These spaces demonstrate that, that with skill, the skill with which human perception, feeling, and movement had been taken seriously to create a sense of awareness and interconnectedness in daily life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're following the same order that we have done now uh, twice, so it works, so we'll keep it going. Uh, we're going to ask three respondents to um, to provide some comments on the presentation. Um, first, I'm going to make a short uh, introduction, not the full version, especially the people that already have introduced uh, Michael R.B. And his first book, Brain, Machines, and Mathematics, served as a basis for diverse contribution to mathematical theories and of computation. Brain theory, robotics, schema theory as a bridge between cognition and neural networks, neurolinguistics, and the language revolution. Um, I want to add to that that uh, he just published another book, um, this one very much related to architecture and neuroscience 
called When uh, Brain Meet Buildings, a conversation between neuroscience and architecture in a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago. Michael, please join us. Wow. Um, so Sarah, in addition to being a friend and uh, an author of many fine books and a skilled architect and someone who has done a lot to promote the conversation between neuroscience and architecture, is a very sneaky person who did not share anything but the abstract of this talk with the three discussants. And so if what I have to say is too long for what I actually know about the topic of the talk. I hope you will forgive me. Well, firstly, in those three different experiences of, of, of the mosque and, and, and the temple and the monastery, we saw the power of a trained phenomenological eye. And one can only wish that um, we could all describe our experiences in the spaces that we have valued as well. Um, it's interesting perhaps that they were illustrated with uh, beautiful, well-chosen photographs, but we only had the sound of the human voice to accompany them. And uh, one wishes that in some sense, one could have an immersive reality in which the touch and the sound and so on that went with it. So. That's the first comment that, that we have here, a sense of a, an experience beautifully recorded. And we have here um, the I am an architect who sees the, the parallels between different spaces that she visits. And I presume, and I'm looking forward to what Suchi has to say about this, who can convert these into the feelings that uh, she wishes new uh, buildings to resonate with the, the feelings of, of the inhabitants. Now, when it comes to the framework, um, I, I, I find the use of resonance in some of what she says helpful, in other cases, not so helpful. And this is what you expected. And I see you smiling, smiling gently. Um, so, so, so let's consider we have this concept of affordance from Gibson and we'll, it'll be brought up again in, in, in my talk. And so Sarah is now asking us to think of it as a resonance. Now, as I reach out for this bottle, my, my hand shapes to, to reach out to this bottle. Now, is that a resonance? Um, you'd say yes. You wouldn't say it's a resonance? It could be a resonance. Changing gets her the same on things, and people have held on to the affordance because it's so helpful. Yeah. In enlivening, it makes so much sense about how we fit the world fits to our needs, whatever those needs might be. But there's something non-conscious that before we can find the use or utility, or we even know what we want, there's something preceding it which I think resonance okay. works to get at. All right. Okay. So one of the studies we did in my group was infants learning to grasp. And uh, it goes something like this, that at first the child will just reach around and it'll contact an object. And so it builds up a, a sort of map relating vision to uh, action in the sense of beginning to build up a space, the peripersonal space of how to reach and contact something. And when the child is very young, it has a grasp reflex. And so when it hits an object, uh, it will tend to grasp it. And then my student came up with the idea that the reinforcement signal for this stage is the joy of grasping. And so it's not that one has any purpose or anything in mind, but one just the hand hits. Uh, maybe you do get a firm grasp, the hand hits, and you slip. But over time, the child's brain is becoming reorganized. The synapses are forming in such a way that 
the form that is seen of the object as it's hit becomes paired with the shaping of the hand. And, and so it is that sensory motor linkage of the learning of the forces that shape the hand in concert with the visual appearance that signals it is what the brain is settling into. So what I'm sort of saying is that for each of the phenomena that Sarah is telling us about, I can both as a human resonate to the, the phenomenology of her description. And for some of the way she uses resonance, I will find the metaphor illuminating. And in some cases, even if I find it illuminating or not, it will make me think about what do I know about the brain that relates to that? Now, I leave open by, by this, uh, which I think is illuminating. I'm, I'm then not saying that in some sense it's that we have, so what on this basis did evolution give us? Um, yes, it must have shaped us so that our, our stature, our, our use of our limbs and so on has some survival value. And then what distinguishes us from many animals is that we have this long developmental period. We, we talked about it earlier, right? The, the fact that we are born helpless and so we, we rely on our caregivers to, to shape us. So that when the child can finally see an object, see the shape and pre-shape the hand to reach it, the child's already about nine months old. This is just one example of the way in which we have evolved perhaps a system that is designed to adapt to allow us to successfully use our hands rather than being pre-shaped in advance. Um, so on other things, I might use a precision grip. But again, there's no sense that our brains were genetically wired for this. So we have, we have evolved to be the creatures whose brains allow us to adapt to the world around us. And then the crucial fact for this, con this conference and for each of the beautiful examples that, that Sarah shared with us is that our relationship is with persons as well as with objects. So we've evolved to have those personal relationships. Now, I believe, as a, when, as, as a scientist, we, we come to believe in our theories with the understanding that others may prove them false later. But I, I believe now that um, the way we got language was that our human brain had only evolved to the point that we had the ability to communicate. Um, in very simple ways in which the use of the hands was at least as important as the use of the voice. And that the passage to language was a matter of tens of millennia of social interaction. As we, for example, were able to use pantomime to talk about, to communicate about things for which we did not have any words spoken or signed. And then eventually um, in most of our societies, uh, the use of the, the voice came to predominate over the use of the hand, but the use of language is a primarily social, vocal, manual performance. And again, in terms of social resonance, we are exquisitely tuned to, to be able to, even though it's a social product, this use of language, it exploits our capabilities just as we didn't evolve to pick up plastic bottles of water but now I can recognize that although it says Fiji, it's not an island, it really is. Okay, I'm being silly now, but I think you get the point of this, this capability of our brains to support adaptation to different systems. Now, the final thing I want to say for Sarah, that I think is interesting, is that, okay, so I claim we get to this, this case where we have language. And one of the things that any parent will know is that one of the basic capabilities that comes with language is the ability to ask questions. And, you know, what's that for, Daddy? Or why are we doing this, Mommy? But eventually, you know, why are we here? What does it mean? We can ask that. So my feeling is that religion arises 
in a sense, from our ability to ask questions and to ask, what more is there? And so it's that resonance, in a sense, the sense of yearning to understand more, to experience more, to be part of something more, that I think is the ultimate re resonance that yields the quest of some of us for religious faith, for others of us to keep asking the questions within the realm of science, but a yearning that informs us all. Thank you. No, I, I just I just wanted to say that, like uh, picking up on what Elisabetta said earlier about priming and what she's studying, she went to this beautiful place in Umbria, but the way her grandmother was behaving spoiled that place and it lingered. So language is always language in a sit situated context. And if if the language is harsh, you know, there's all sorts of resonances which which happen. There's 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 interruptions of behaviors. There's d developmental interruptions even. So like affective state, I think resonance helps us understand the pervasiveness of our affective states and how finely tuned we are to what what you are telling me without telling me. And I think another revealing dimension of resonance is that I hear everybody here saying resonance. I resonate with that idea or, oh yeah, we really resonate. So we all kind of have this understanding, this mutual understanding of what resonance is, but we haven't articulated what that means and what we might, what layers of experience that might open up. Because another thing that Zachary said about time, you know, time, synchrony, synergy, they're very time oriented because they have to do with surfaces and boundaries, you know, and tones and them being received. So these are subtle, more subtle ways of understanding experience, I think, if we, if we look deeper into them, and maybe operationalize these concepts. The camera. Um, yeah. <laughs> Our second respondent will be Tom Budin. Uh, he's a professor of religion at Fordham University in New York City, studying the entanglement of cultural practices, Christian theologies, and spiritual exercises. Tom is currently conducting research about visitor experiences at the Pantheon in Rome, sponsored by the Templeton Religion Trust. This is such a fascinating paper to try to come up with a response to that is in any way equal to the consideration and depth of the reflection. And I'm not going to match that, but I'm going to just try to say a few things in response. One has to do with uh, a res uh, how you help me understand something about the way I think about my research at the Pantheon. Open that up. Uh, the second has to do with a connection to the research of uh, Jin Baek about the Church of the Light in Ibaraki, Japan. Uh, and the third is just a question. And I think it will take less than five minutes, Julio. So uh, the first is vis-a-vis -vis the Pantheon, thinking about uh, resonance. I have often wondered if the Pantheon one has to try to come up with theories about why the Pantheon works, right? How it works. One thing I've that's come to me and that I'm sure has probably come to architects before is that the Pantheon may, one reason it may work spatially in terms of spatial body, built body resonance is this consanguinity between the human body and the architecture. Uh, a built environment that kind of shares with the body a simultaneous containment and decontainment. 
That building is a containing, decontaining building at the same time. You're always within the containment, decontainment. The simultaneous closeness, openness of the body. The body is a, as, a, as, as um, sealed and yet open at the same time. Right? So I feel both contained and decontained when I am there. And a lot of the responses we're getting in the right and responses on the survey go to this experience of feeling held. Some people feel held, some people feel opened. Some people feel both opened and held at the same time. And I wonder how this is kind of good news in terms of a somatic sense of self. Um, so you're re referred inward and outward all at once. So this, the Pantheon, you know, I'm thinking about the resonance, the Pantheon seems to be a building that both shelters in an embrace and yet remains open. Not because openness means unfinished, but because openness means what it means to be complete. So I'm thinking about that. Uh, then the, the second piece uh, of response I would offer is to uh, Jin Baek, who teaches at um, Seoul National University in South Korea. And Jin Baek's marvelous book uh, called Nothingness, Tarao Ando's Christian Sacred Space, which is a combination of uh, Buddhist and Christian reflection on this church of the light in Japan, uh, which features a, a raked uh, dark chapel. I didn't bring any slides because I wasn't prepared for this, but a raked dark chapel where the, the only uh, image you see is a glass cross uh, at, at the bottom uh, that is just letting through whatever light is coming through uh, in that moment. Um, and Jin Bake working with um, concepts from Japanese philosophy, uh, uh, Nishido Kitaro and others of the so-called Kyoto School, um, writes this, I was prepared to quote Jin Baek to you, with, with, the, with you, with us. Uh, Jin Baek writes, physiological posture is not simply biologic or, or, or anatomical, but is the basis for the significance of cultural practice. Instead of a subject standing over against an object where distance must be explained, Baek centers the body, which uses the Japanese term from uh, Kitaro Shintai, uh, that is, uh, the body becomes the body by taking in the space. The body is a fundamentally closed and open system simultaneously. That's what Shintai means. The perceiver apprehends the situation and is intermeshed with what appears. So we are always intermeshed with the environment, right? And so uh, uh, Beck argues that architecture has a corporeal efficacy. The body articulates the world and the body is articulated by the world. When I perceive the concrete here to be something cold and hard, I recognize the body as something warm and soft. In this way, the body in its dynamic relationship with the world becomes the shintai, the, 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 uh, the co-relation to the building. It is only in the sense of the body as shintai uh, that the architecture speaks to the body. By encountering coldness, one empties the self to become coldness. Through this perceptual matrix, the warm eye and the cold wall co-emerge, the resonance, right? The warm eye and the cold wall co-emerge. In this co-emergence, the wall comes to appear as a corporeal fig figure that faces the eye. And this, this reflection goes on to talk about the encounter with the cross of light in the sunlight coming through the cross. Architecture, Bake says, and I'll finish the discussion of Bake with this, architecture can cleanse and sharpen the sensory organs, leading to a retuned body. I was thinking about that as you narrated your experience, architecture retuning the body. Now, a question I have is, I notice, I'm very interested in this, what seems to me like the spiritual exercise of architects narrating their experience, or architecture scholars narrating their experience of going through buildings, but you seem to have kind of an expressive theory of design here. In other words, what's built into the building is actually what you experienced. That, that I, I noticed that kind of backstory. Um, and I'm curious about, because what happens in my ethnographic work at the Pantheon is, first of all, there are all sorts of debates about what was built into that building. It's not entirely clear. There are various theories about what was built in. Um, but not every, people have such 
a, fair, a range of fairly divergent experiences there. And as someone said earlier, it, a lot of it depends on how many people are in the space with you um, and how noisy it is and all sorts of things. So under what conditions were you able to experience the exact intention of the designer well, in, in a way? I can cheat because I'm an architect. Okay. And so like Anjan was saying, we are trained to see certain things and appreciate certain things. Yeah. And also, so trained, you know, training, mm. but also looking back and reflecting on what because every time you design buildings, other buildings you've been in, at least for me, make themselves present. Mm -hmm. And so you're always learning from buildings, even if you're not in them, which is why I think visiting architectural masterpieces should be a fundamental part of every architect's education. Mm -hmm. Because you really resonate, like you resonate with these buildings and mm -hmm. they linger. Mm. They have a long fuse. It's a, it's a thick experience. Yes. So they have very long fuse that keeps going mm. in your memory. Mm -hmm. So, and I think these layers of resonance make that fuse even longer. Mm -hmm. So it unfolds over time in a way that works with, you know, our mind and body in a really interesting way. Mm. I, I let me just close with this uh, is I, I would love to see that kind of narration set alongside the narration of other visitors who are not architects or architecturally trained going through that space, maybe with a family or in wheelchairs or on crutches and just kind of really uh, open the space up in that way too, um, and see if you see if what the relationship is between design and experience in that way. Yeah. But thank you. I'm very happy to introduce now Suchi already. <clears throat> so was here this um, last fall. I had a great pleasure and honor to work with Suchi, and she hasn't shared the podium yet. So now and tomorrow will be pretty much present. But let me tell you, Suchi, her 20-year-old award-winning studio, ready-made, embodies her ethos form follows feeling. Using her aesthetic to amplify the potential of design, her practice spans various uh, typologies of all scale from interiors to installations to architecture. She currently teaches at the School of Architecture at Columbia and the Cooper Union. Welcome, Suchi. Um. Thanks, everyone. And Sarah, thank you. Um, I, this is just going to be sort of a loose set of thoughts and a responses to what you said and what to Thomas brought up, um, and both from the perspective of being a practicing architect. So first of all, thank you for the beauty of what you showed, as well as the way in which you speak and write about it. Because I've been a fan of Sarah's writing for a long time now, and not just the ideas that she manages to bring across to those of us who practice and don't write as well as she does, but to really understand these very complex um, ideas in these in this very beautiful way. And some of what I'm talking about here is this this concept. I know you were talking about synchrony and resonance, but really there's this concept of beauty that underpins all of it. And the idea of synchrony, I was wondering um, whether, in your opinion, that um, relates to atmosphere. Is essentially what we're trying to create is this atmosphere. And Michael and I have had this conversation, um, at least lightly, about um, what we call prototypical atmospheres and the, and the ability of architecture to really affect you. So one of the things that I was really touched by um, when I was listening to you was really that what you're talking about is the capacity of architecture, the capacity of architecture to move you, the capacity of architecture to make you feel things, the capacity of architecture to make you know more about yourself and the human condition, that we can do all of these things, even though, you know, as practicing architects in the world, that's not what a client often comes to you with, but these are, this is our like sneaky agenda. We put it in, in all of our work. We try to get it in there one way or the other. So by hook or crook, we're giving people more than what they asked for. And to some degree, every example you showed gave more 
than probably was asked for in that situation. And that happened because of a passion for architecture, or for a passion for creating space and experience. And having been in at least one of them, which was La Tourette, um, I had the, the pleasure of staying overnight in a beautiful little cell, which I, I imagine you did. Um, and listening both to the resonance, I found actually, I can't remember whether you put it in resonance or synch synchrony, but I was found myself really resonating with both the proportions, the light, the lack of light, the sound and the silence. And it was this incredible experience of really being able to work with all of your senses in this space in a very um, orchestrated procession, a hierarchy that you didn't feel you were forced to experience at any moment. And I think that's something that in all of your examples and really what underpins this, and I'm, since I'm speaking here to architects, I want to bring up is that the, the skill of the people who created these, these places, which had to do with their understanding of mathematics, their understanding of acoustics, their understanding of materiality, light, all of these things, but the skill with which everything was put together to make you feel like you were experiencing something for yourself. That wasn't, you know, something you were meant to do, <laughs> that you were prescribed, that this was your own experience. And I think that that's something, you know, really. Um, that I have to bring up as uh, one of the things that I hope as architects we work towards um, creating. And also um, really just the, the, to see this in these images in this beautiful way and hear you talk about them, just it brought up all these different memories for me. It was really interesting that somehow it, it went into memory. You know, the first thing I remembered was growing up as a young child in India and in South India, where, you know, it was quite loud at the time. And you'd wake up to hearing the imam's call to prayer in the morning and the devotional songs from the temple and then the church bells ringing and everything happening at the same time. Because luckily I lived in a secular, a secular uh, city. Um, and really having all of these kinds of memories and then being an immigrant and coming to a different country and feeling this sense of silence <laughs> and sound and car alarms and different things that became my sonic architecture. So I was thinking about those things while you were talking about kind of the, the beauty and, you know, this kind of resonance and synchrony. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but I'm throwing that out there. Um, you know, in case that triggers but, a thought for you. But but I think that that just shows the richness of memory and and how it's triggered. And, and the capacity of architecture to do that. You and, know. and because see, memory resonates. It's like, it's like a resonant chamber and, and, and something happens and it's, it, it is like plucking a string and all of a sudden these, your mind starts going back to places you totally forgot about. Yeah, and that also is a power of architecture that we don't think about. And even in the Japanese temple, you know, how it takes you back, the tatami mat takes you back to the quality of the actual grass that it was made from. And these kinds of things, whether that lives in our sort of gathered collective cultural memory or really our personal memory of actually touching some grass and knowing how that relates to the, the made object, these kinds of connections, I think, are really, really important to explore in architecture. And that's why I think neuroaesthetics and this conference and this conversation has been so rich and so interesting is because it allows us as practitioners to try to understand better the capabilities of this amazing art that we get to call ours, that we get to work with and make all of these spaces that affect people in these very, very deep ways, you know, not just, and, you know, uh, Michael will uh, often tease me about this, but I do say form follows feeling. And I, I believe that form should follow feeling, that, that the purpose of our world is to make us feel a certain way, whether, you know, hopefully that's towards our well being and towards being, you know, uh, empathetic and feeling our agency and, and being the people that we should be, you know, but that's not the expressed intention of architecture. To some, to, so to some degree, I wanted to ask you what these concepts of resonance and synchrony might have to do with the kind of hidden capability of architecture, which is really its most powerful. And with that, I'll leave it with Sarah. Well, these are, these are, I mean, these are new ideas to me, but I know it sounds really, it, it is very mundane, but the sound of that truck making the windows, the glass in the, in the casements rattle was, it was kind of an aha moment about what resonance could could be or how we could theorize resonance to to 
to make a richer, uh, like to enrich the way we design. You know, thinking about it in different in different modalities because because these are you know we talk about um, you know multi sensory architecture, but it goes way beyond the five senses. It goes into worlds that we haven't touched upon yet, like interpersonal synchrony. The fact that we're all syncing up right now and an example I, I didn't want to show because everybody knows about it was like a popular example of resonance is what happened to the millennium bridge do you know that have you seen that the millennium bridge on opening day a bunch of people started walking on it and it started to sway and everybody synchronized their footsteps so it wasn't exact, it wasn't just re resonance, it was the propensity of people to synchronize with perfect strangers. And they all started the swaying, the movement of the bridge caused them to move in a certain way. And they all moved in exactly the same way to keep the bridge from falling down, basically. In this destabilized moment, it, they they synchronized automatically. So we have this, this ability to synchronize, we synchronize with daylight, but we also synchronize with each other in ways that we we don't realize. And so I find that an interesting untapped area. And Thomas, this was for, for you when you were saying, you know, as an architect, are you thinking about just this one person's experience? Or are you thinking about everyone's experience? And we truly really are trained and should be trained to think about multiple layers and varieties of experience this is what we do i don't just think about it but you know i don't think about a building from my perspective i think about it from my client's perspective all of the other kind of subsets of clients that exist around that client people that they may not even be thinking of so if i'm actually an ethical architect this is what i'm doing i'm thinking about all of the possibilities and certainly how someone in a wheelchair or you know people who are differently abled or neurodiverse or anything how am I thinking about all that? And I know that to some degree, I'm not going to be able to answer all of those questions, but they inform the solution that I come up with. So I have to think about that, you know? So I don't think that these spaces, and Sarah, correct me if you disagree, were constructed for a certain kind of experience. I think what they were doing personally is really channeling kind of this, um, synchronicity between all of the, the the needs that were expressed, whether it was for awe, for wonder, for delight. And when you say those things, you have to think that everyone in this world deserves all wonder and delight. You know, So what does that mean to all of these different people? And maybe all of those elements made it in. And that's what brings in the color. That's what brings in the texture. That's what brings in the scale. That's what brings in you know the, the replication of nature, all of these kinds of things, because you're trying to give people commonalities to respond to within any given space. So I would make the argument that any space really, and any properly designed space is responding to this entire set of, of needs. Okay, we are gonna open this uh, uh, to the audience. Any have questions or comments? Zach has some. Um, so thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, I guess that um, over the course of, well, my, my few years in research, uh, I learned at least two things from biology. The first one is that the human organism, or actually all organisms, they adapt to their environment, not the other way around. The second one being that everything oscillates. And I think that's a, a very important uh, thing to remember, especially in terms of philosophy, uh, process philosophy, to be uh, to be exact. Um, now this, I think that something very interesting comes from the idea of applying resonance to to architecture. And uh, as everyone else has been saying, I resonate with that idea. Um, but I do think that Michael has a fantastic point in terms of uh, sort of saying that well, sometimes it works when you talk about res resonating with the with the environment. Other times it just doesn't, and it didn't, and then it just reduces, quote unquote, to a metaphor. Now, um, so to resonate um, completely like, uh, by, the, by definition is when you have two signals that start to align. 
This is by definition a resonant when you start to resonate. We can talk about rhythmic resonation. We can talk about uh, 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 well synchrony uh, and so on. But something tells me that this is not what you mean when you talk about resonance. I think that when you talk about resonance, it's something that goes beyond the the mere fact that two signals or more can get aligned and start to synchronize. I get the feeling that because if you talk about this from a neurobiological perspective, we talk about that typically in, in terms of neural entrainment or uh, any kind of, of synchrony between uh, large scale uh, populations. But something tells me that you talk about this as something that goes even way beyond that. And now my question becomes, uh, I think if I have to cut this into a single question, um, do you mean resonance in the literal term in the sense that Gibson would talk about it as information being picked up because it has a self, like you sort of self tuning to the environment, or do you go even beyond that? And if so, what is that? Just wait a second. Can you give uh, the yeah, microphone? The microphone? Yes. There we go. I showed that image of, of my resonance image. It showed showed a violin in the wood, and then it showed a wavelength like this, and then a wavelength like this. That's the what what I wanted to convey in in my examples was that. Through design, we can amplify people's experience. So as, as a violin, the body of a violin amplifies the vibrations that are going on the strings and changes that, so we can work with human perception in, in very specific ways to amplify and intensify experience. So resonance with two oscillators is how you usually think about it, but also the match frequencies you know, the material composition of some things have natural sympathies with each, with each other, which is can be metaphoric and it can also be literal. And just in a second. I, I would love to hear um, you speak a little bit about the difference or the about harmonics, resonance and harmonics. Um, I what I hear you talking about harmonics when you're saying resonance, and it's not just a well. That's my question. Resonance versus harmonics are they similar, or what, what, what's your thought? Well, I think I think a, an example of harmonics in architecture is the way the the way the colors worked in the mosque. That when you see the mosque dome, you see blue, but there's seven colors in that. And they're all chosen carefully to reinforce the, the feeling of blue, to reinforce the blue tile. So I would call that harmonics. But they're 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 like background singers to, to create this harmony. And that we can use techniques like that, and architects throughout time have used techniques like that to amplify certain experiences and to create certain specific experiential effects. Yes. Uh, Sarah, hi, I'm Shay. Um, I've read all your books and I love them. Um, but uh, I think about resonant architecture a lot. It's it's kind of my thing. It's I, I geek on this quite a bit. And earlier, someone was talking about emotion as this kind of Precognitive whole body experience through which then feeling is filtered and action takes place. And so, you know, Zach talking about like the metaphorical kind of I'm resonating with the space, I think it's still quite literal in that sense, you know, that these are these are actual body states and physiological responses that we're having before we even, you know, it's it, there was also the talk about the split second reaction of fascination from um from the first talk last night, right? Um, and then earlier we heard about architectural atmospheres, which by their very nature permeate through us, right? They become part of us. That's why EOC or, you know, toxins in the air are really a problem in architecture. But then to become 
even kind of disgustingly literal about entrainment and synchronicity and architecture. The uh, Mixed Reality Lab in Nottingham produced an installation some years back called Exo Building, which was a tent like structure that read the physiology of the inhabitant and flexed in and out according to their breathing. And, and, and then it, it played back their heart rate through a pulse in the floor. And what they found was that after 10 or 15 minutes, and I'm, I'm terribly misquoting this, but uh, heart rate and breathing rate slowed down and, and became to synchronize, began to synchronize. And then they took the experiment one step further and had the computer processing their bio feet input artificially slow down the audible heart rate and the flexing of the tent for the breathing rate. And it increased the rate at which their body synchronized to that system. And so I think top to bottom, we resonate in, in every literal and metaphorical way and the two are not separate it's not a dichotomy here you know and so i i i look forward to the next iteration of this talk because um i i think there's a lot there and that's not even a question so i'm sorry <laughs> uh, could, could i just intervene i, I mean it, this is really going too far if you don't mind my saying we start with a very, you know, the violin is beautiful, right? And we've got the string and you think, and then we jump from that to enhancing uh, human experience. And you say that you're creating resonances, but the, there's nothing that informs an architect how to, let's say, put the tiles together from knowing about the concept of resonance. So even if you find that you're inspired by the concept, the concept of resonance, to find new ways of creating these metaphorical resonances, there still have to be new discoveries made by the architect or the neuroscientist or, or whoever. And I, I just think if we're in a setting where we're not just talking about phenomenology of architecture and finding words in which to convey our experience, but talking about the neurophenomenology, where we really want to understand what is going on in the brain of the creator of architecture as well as the experience of architecture, just to say, oh, I resonate to beautiful tiles. I resonate to what Sadaka did. I resonate to this. It's not going far. This is the your phenomenological description and using such terms was the first step. And then you began to get into, yeah, well, it's the way they didn't use stained glass, they, and they were too poor to do this. And they began to put in that. The mullions and then the mullions were done in this way. And, and so I really think one must be aware of thinking that coming up with a general arc, a general set of terms like resonance and synchrony, and then using them as adjectives, I mean finding adjectives to discriminate them doesn't take us far enough to I think fulfill the challenge of this symposium. And and I you know I'm I'm the other way, right? I'm lousy at getting you build the building and make your experience but well what i what i what i said i did was inspired by albert Morgan, who said imaginative you know true discovery is taking is like taking off an airplane you start on solid ground and then you go up into thin air you don't know where you're gonna land but you're up there and then you come down to earth and you make it work and that's where you come in <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Um, first, thank you so much for just your taking us through the experience. I'm an architect and I've n I haven't been to any of those three places, but it's just, I was just, just the poetic um, language and the images. I, you took me on a journey that I really want to go visit these places. But my question is, uh, earlier today, you said that as architects, designers, we are not trained in experience. And um, I, I do agree with that. And I, I wanted to, I think part of it is also because we're not trained to be 
in tune with our body. We're constantly, uh, you know, I, I worked in New York City, worked in New York City for 20 years in, in many different firms. Um, we're not, we're constantly up in the head and just in terms of, we're not, um, we're not really tuned into our body. We don't have, we're not trained in what I call the inner technologies of design, where we can really access, you know, that felt sense, this kind of subtlety of felt senses, the intuition, the, the, all of these things. So how do you propose that we train better in this and we become more attuned to the body and even be able to access these creative resources we already have within us, but we're, we're just, we don't have the pathways to really access that, I think. Well, um, when I said, you know, I had these pre, just I'm answering your question a long way around, which is I had these preconceived notions of that I was just not gonna like La Tourette. Like I, I was had this fixed idea that it was gonna be overrated. I'd heard so much about it. But I literally from the it was so unpretentious the the way to get there. And then once I was in, I was being taken care of. Like I felt like some some someone had thought everything out in this very careful way. And it turns out that Le Corbusier, his whole promenade was this carefully studied development through his lifetime. This was one of his last buildings. So he was, he was, he was old and experienced, but he also had this collaborator who was an ex extremely sensitive, gifted musician and mathematician. And I think really that's the strength of that building came from Xenakis. But um, what I wanted to say is that Le Corbusier took dance and music training. His brother was a pianist. And so it was, um, I'm slipping on the name that Harry Mulgrave has written about where all the European avant-garde went to, to these before the war broke out, that went and trained with these musicians because this, this musician, to be a good musician, he thought they had to know how to dance. So all these architects were learning how to dance. And so this embodied experience, I think, came out in, in, in this building I was in because the, the, the pathways, the slopes of the ramp had very specific, um, the fact that the church was the only place located that was touching the earth and at the lowest point, that, that all came from this, his lifelong training and lifelong concern. So I think it's like a value shift that has to happen. And also another thing about architects, architects learn through apprenticeship for the large part of our his for the large part of our professional history. It's only recently that we, you know, went to schools and then got out and then worked in an architect's office, but never really engaged with the materials directly. So that needs to change. All right, well, let's uh, give a hand to the panel. Thank you, everybody.